Okay, then welcome everyone uh, to the six people in the room present for today's IEEE workshop on LT SPY circuit simulation. Uh, my name is Matthias Magdowski. I'm a senior consultant for network simulation at the Otto von Gerke University of Magdeburg. And of course, I'm a scientific co worker here. So, as usual, um, hopefully, it should work. I also say hello to the three people watching it on Twitch. Um, so, write something nice in the chat. Also, say hello. I have the chat here with me. And so, I will then um, share my screen and already go. So after introducing the title and so on, already go to the second slide. Um, and I have a short survey for you. So I would appreciate it if you take out your cell phone, um, scan this QR code. And there should be a survey that um, looks like this, that you can insert a number. So usually I had some, does it work? Does it look like this? Yeah, and then there should be some motivation questions. So you, you, um, I will, I will maybe shortly uh, switch over to my browser and go out of this window and maybe go to the presentation mode here. So yeah, there are already seven people on the page. If I copy the link and if I open it up in a new browser window. So there's a Q and A, you can, you can pop in questions there and there should be uh, this year workshop or um, this question series here. And there you can insert a number between one <laughs> and a hundred. Maybe I should also set zero, <laughs> uh, but probably this was the basic setting. Uh, I'm not sure, let me, let me check if I can go back. Um, and change change the question in a way that uh, bearbeiten that uh, minimum yeah okay so now minimum should now now zero should also be possible okay so let's see um, if I hit enter there then there should be some um, results okay and. Most people say, oh, we, we have five answers already. Um, yeah, so, so some people say nine to zero and t t 10 to 20, but obviously not a lot. Okay, so then probably you're, you're the perfect audience for me today because it's a very, very basic introductory workshop to LT Spice and circuit simulation. Okay, excellent. So. Short motivation, as an electric engineer, of course, you want to simulate um, circuits and especially if you have circuits with transient thickness and if you have circuits with nonlinear elements, uh, diodes, transistors, semiconductor elements, then it can be very, very challenging or almost impossible to do calculations by hand. So in this case, you need something like circuit simulation. And um, so as an example, I have a not too complicated circuit. Uh, we have an AC source, we have four diodes, uh, we have a resistor and we have a capacitor. <coughs> and the question is what happens to this output voltage here if we change the value of this capacitor? So d does anyone has an idea what is, what is the purpose of the circuit here? It's a rectifier, exactly. So it changes our AC voltage, AC current here on this side into a DC, more or less DC voltage current on this side. Is, is any, everyone aware how this, how the circuit works? Uh, okay, so if we have positive voltage, um, current will go via this diode through the load and return on this diode and if we have, um, if we have a negative voltage, so then positive current will go this way, will go the, via this diode, go through the load and return on this diet. So we change an alternating current and voltage on this side into a more or less DC current on this side. So, and w what does this capacitor here do? It's kind of stores energy, exactly. And it, what, what's, what, what's the purpose? 
um, of storing energy here because I mean at the end we want to get energy power from the source into the load. Why, sh why should we store energy here in this capacitor? What, what would happen if we don't have this capacitor? Yeah, but I mean, we, we, it's not like that we store it there like in a battery for, for a couple of minutes. It's just storage because this capacitor at the end won't be super large. Still, it would be some tens and hundreds of microfarads. Hello. Uh, but it's not that we store energy there for minutes or hours or days or so, just for some milliseconds. Um, it's, it's storage to smoothen the voltage here. So if I said, uh, I mean, this is some AC voltage, so it's sinusoidal and we would get some sinusoid, more or less sinusoidal voltage here, but just with the positive, um, positive parts of the wave, let's say. And so here we can somehow store some energy in there. And if and this will smoothen this voltage. So it, it's like an averaging circuit. We get a more or less average voltage. And um, so I've already opened this up in LT Spice. Um, and so without doing something here, so it's the very same circuit. We have some diodes, we have a resistance, we have this capacitance at the end. And um, it's, um, if we, if we check here, it's a 50 hertz source with 50 volts of amplitude. And we check two different values of this capacitance here, one millifarad and 10 millifarads. And if we run, so we can see that now already the simulation is finished. I can check now the output voltage here. And we have one case where this output voltage is changing much more. This is the case where this capacitor is small. And then we have a case where this output voltage is much more smooth. And this is uh, for the 10 times higher capacitor. And yeah, the, the idea is now to try to understand really what happens here inside not such circuit, but also inside such simulation. Um, yeah, but, but already said, to calculate this would be very, very challenging if you would do it just by hand. So circuit simulation is a good, very good and very handy tool for this. So after this motivation, I will try to give a brief introduction into this LT Spice and what some details about it. And, and, and so then we will take a look on how does it really work on the inside. And for this, we will um, let's say increase the complexity step by step. So at first we will select an example where it's totally easy possible to calculate it by hand. Just calculate this uh, DC operating point um, in a circuit. Um, this is what every electrical engineering student, at least also in Germany, does in its first semester. So then we extend the complexity a little bit, go to AC circuits. And in this case, um, then we do complex number analyzes with complex phases. Still, it's possible to do it by hand. It's much more easy to do it, let's say, in uh, MATLAB or something like this, or if you have a calculator that can handle, deal with complex numbers, but it's not impossible to do so. And this is what German students would learn to do in their second semester of um, an electrical engineering bachelor's study. And so then, to increase complexity, we go to a transient analysis, really simulating something in time domain. Uh, this is what we would maybe do at the end of the second semester, solving differential equations. But our circuit simulator does not really do, at the end, it does solve differential equations, but not analytically just numerically, let's say. And the idea um, and advantage is if we go into the time domain, do transient stuff, then we can also include nonlinear circuit elements, diodes, transistors. And this is what will be then the last example. And finally, of course, there will be some summary. Okay, so let's have a brief introduction into LT-SPICE. 
This is the logo of the software and this abbreviation LT stands for linear technology. And so until some years ago, this software was um, developed and manufactured, let's say, and distributed by linear technology, with, which is a big manufacturer for lots of electronic components, semiconductor components. And the idea for them to distribute the software was that within the software you could find lots of libraries for components from linear technology. So th the business model of their software was a little bit like advertisement. You could download, you can download the software for free. Um, you want to develop something, you want to simulate some circuits, then you use the models of linear technology and you say, hey, in the simulation it's working so nicely, uh, let's also buy the, comp the components at this company. And um, I don't know, four, five, six years ago, linear technology was bought by another company which is called Analog Devices. And so now you can download this LT Spice from the website of Analog Devices. Still, they were clever enough not to rename it because this LT Spice was such a good brand name already that it would be very stupid to rename it into AD Spice for Analog Devices Spice or something like this. Okay. So it runs on um, all modern operating systems. So the most recent version runs under Windows 10, 64-bit and forward, and under Mac OS. Um, under Linux, you can also use it, but you have to somewhere emulate it. And it's kind of a small program. So it's just something at around 100 megabytes. And for this 100 megabytes, it can really, really do a lot. And I mean, more... <laughs> Yeah, it's always the, this problem with software engineering that software bloats up. Um, so I think earlier versions, they would have been just 8 megabytes or maybe 10 megabytes. They would have the very same functionality, but running, running under Windows XP or Windows 7 or whatnot. So um, yeah, I think software as usual just grows in size and it's, it's freeware. So you can use this program for free which is very nice. You can also use it for free for commercial purposes in a company, no problem, uh, which is also, I think, in the daily life of engineers, very, very useful. But uh, it's closed source. So you cannot really look into the software, what it does. And this is sometimes a problem and sometimes a pity for research, because if you are a researcher at the university or at some other research institution and do something with this circuit simulator, then sometimes you really want to know what happens inside, how exactly is the calculation done. And here you can sometimes only guess, let's say. So you, are, you, you can be never exactly sure which formula is exactly used to this, to this and this kind of, of analysis. Okay, so this is the maintainer, uh, Mike Engelhardt. Um, very famous and iconic because he's always, more, more, or at least what I've read, always wearing this hat. Um, unfortunately, he, he, and he's also very popular and present at, at electronics uh, conferences. Unfortunately, I've never met them because I usually only attend the EMC conferences and the electronics uh, and developers conferences. Um, and so they, they somehow also make fun of this spice which is also the English word for spice, um, and do something that they say workshops, cooking with master chef Mike Engelhardt, cooking with LT Spice. And um, I, I've not mentioned, but this spice is some abbreviation, some acronym, or some maybe some backronym like, like laser. Does anyone know what laser stands for? So it's laser is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And so this SPICE is uh, a similar acronym for simulation program with integrated circuit emphasis. Um, something like this. And, and interestingly, or, so there, there are many, many versions and many, very, many variants of this SPICE, but originally it was um, a student project, let's say. There was some lecturer at the University of Berkeley in California and 
I think it was in the end of 1960s, uh, beginning of 1970s, somewhere in this age, where the university would get a, a huge IBM mainframe computer. And so people were thinking, okay, now we have this computer. It can compute stuff, what to do with it? And then some uh, electrical engineering lecturer had the idea, okay, let's use this computer for circuit simulation, for circuit calculation. And then with a group of master students, they somehow programmed the very first version of this SPICE, which was, of course, not, there was no graphical user interface. There was um, yeah, a, a text-based way how to insert circuits and how to get the output. We will, we will somehow see this text-based a thing still exists, but of course in the in an actual versions you can just, as you have seen, uh, you have a graphical user interface, you can draw your circuit, um, you can plot results directly. But originally this uh, was a student project and, and still very many of these SPICE versions exist. So to input numbers, there are different conventions. You can just insert integers, you can insert real numbers, um, for international students, it's very common to use this dot as a decimal separator. For German students, it's uncommon because, you know, we use the comma. Then you can also use the scientific notation. So 1e3 means 10 to the power of 3. Um, or you can also use the, the SI units. So 1k also means 1000. Um, there are some issues still related to this. So the input is case insensitive. So a capital K or a lower case K does the same thing. And so if you write one big M, one capital M, it's not mega, it's milli. So if you want to have one, one mega ohm, you need to write meg, which gives one mega. Then you don't give any units at all. You just give the unit prefixes. So if you would like to have one, a one farad capacitor, and if you write one f because you, you mean one one farad, it's wrong. You, you get one you would get one femto, which is very very small, ten to the power of minus twelve or so, um, or more ten to the power of minus fifteen, I think. Pico out of no, even less, I think. Yeah, uh, so, some, something very small, and. Um, these older SPICE versions, they don't directly support the mu character for the micro for 10 to the power of minus t uh, 6, but newer versions do. And um, as a replacement, you can also just use a U, which gives the same as micro. Oops. Okay, so then there, there are some alternatives that I would at least like to mention. Um, so the... Um, Another very, very popular, especially in companies, version of SPICE is P-SPICE, which was um, um, a, yeah, its own program a couple of years ago, but I think since 10 years or so, it's part of a bigger suit ORCID from Cadence. And there the idea is it's more a program to develop to lay out printed circuit boards. So you lay out your printed circuit board and as a byproduct, you can also simulate your printed circuit board. But it's a very big software. You need a license. You have to install several, mega, uh, several gigabytes to just do circuit simulation. So from my point of view, it's not very handy um, if you just want to do circuit simulation. If you want to really lay out printed circuit boards, then it's maybe, maybe a powerful tool. Then uh, the TET stands for Theoretical Electrical Engineering, Theoretische Elektrotechnik. And this CONCERC is a program developed by our colleagues from the Technical University of Hamburg, uh, where I will go this week to also give a talk on Thursday. And this is also yeah, part of a bigger software suite. Um, and the main program is called CONCEPT. And CONCEPT is a field, electromagnetic field simulation program based on the method of moments. And the CONCERC is the circuit simulation tool. So it just runs in the frequency domain. You can also do transient analysis there, but just via inverse Fourier transform. But you cannot really include um, nonlinear elements because it's not made for this. So, but the advantage is you can couple it with this field simulator. So you could, um, for example, simulate an antenna 
do electric, electromagnetic field simulation, how, this, this, how does a certain antenna radiate, or you have a complicated transmission line structure somewhere, and how does this transmission line um, structure act as a parasitic antenna receiving some sickness in terms of electromagnetic compatibility, and then you can couple it with the circuit and see what happens in the circuit. Um, and it's, it's very nice for our also fundamentals of electrical engineering students because it can directly handle complex impedances. So if you have something like 10 ohm plus J10 ohm, 10 ohm real part, 10 ohm imaginary part, you cannot in introduce this or include this in LT spice, not directly. And here you can do. So it's, uh, for, for this, it's a very handy tool. Then the third software to mention here is called Easy EDA. It's also more a layouting program, but you can also do um, circuit simulation. And the big and huge advantage there is it runs in your browser. So it's a little bit like if you know LaTeX on your computer and you know Overleaf as the LaTeX in your browser portal website, then the, the the easy EDA is like the, the, the web-based LT Spice. And in the background, it would also run an LT Spice solver. So it's very nice. You don't need to install any software on your computer. You just go to this website. Of course, you have to have a good internet connection. You have to have a huge screen and a powerful and, and, and uh, actual browser. But then you can draw your circuits there. You can run simulations somewhere in the cloud. You can share circuits with your colleagues. Um, and co-workers and fellow students and stuff. So it's, it's very handy, but of course the disadvantage is you work in the cloud. You work on someone else's computer, so you don't really know where your data is stored. Um, this is maybe sometimes an issue in companies and so on. Um, but yeah, for, for research and for student projects, I think it's a very good and very useful and handy tool. And then this COOKS or CAX, stands for, is, is also some abbreviation, stands for quite universal circuit simulator. And this was some open source project, I think that still exists and still is somehow alive, but there, there are some people maintaining it are missing. But the, the, the idea there was to have a good circuit simulator that can do all stuff. So DC, AC, transient, nonlinear stuff, um, noise analysis and so on. And you can really look in there what, what it does. So, and they have, they have also a very, very good manual with lots of formulas and the theory behind. So if you want to know, if you, I don't know, want to at some point program your own circuit simulator, you can just look into their manual how it's done because all the theory how to do it is written there. This is the big advantage of this Cooks. And um, yeah, so it's some open source tool. Um, so you could use it and also extend it with your own program. Okay, then we can take a look into the section, how does it work? And at first I would like to mention the problem of every simulation. Some of you may already know it. It's bullshit in, bullshit out or garbage in, garbage out. So the, the computer will always do something. The, the problem is often the person sitting in front of the computer yeah, and you have to explain your problem to the computer, to the simulation program in the correct way. And then the computer will do something. And then you also have to interpret the result in the correct way. And therefore you somehow, at least for simple examples, should need to know how it works. And um, because otherwise you, 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 you run into problems, um, as said, because the computer will always do something, you will always get a result, but then you have no idea if it's right or wrong. So you need to have some, some ideas. Could this answer, could this result be correct? What plausibility check could I do? Um, and I think the biggest problem or the biggest mistake that you can do is to take the most complicated example that you will ever find, put it in a simulator, click run, then you get a result and then you believe it. <laughs> because it, it, won't be, it won't be true in, <laughs> in few cases only. So I always suggest to start with simple models and then ex where, where you understand what you are doing and then extend them, extend them, extend them until you are um, at your real problem. So that's why we will take a look at some very uh, simple example at first. We will take a look at this bridge circuit. So we have a current source 
and we have uh, uh, four resistors, resistor one and two are in series, three and four are in series, and these two branches are connected in parallel. And so what then LT SPICE and all SPICE based simulators do in the background is nodal analysis or in German Knotenspannungsanalyse. And so for this you somehow need to number the nodes. And you select one node as the reference node and number it with zero and you start to number all the other nodes. So let's say this node is number one, this node is number two, this node, even if this is not, not really a node because there is no current, um, current branch, um, we, we still will say this is a node, this is a node. So we have four nodes in total and we have let's say three independent nodes in the circuit. And so what SPICE then does in the background, um, and we can have a look at this in a moment, is it's, it's writing such a net list. So this would also have been the way how the students at the end of the 1960s or early 1970s would have explained the circuit to the computer in these days. They also would have written such a net list. And the net list contains all these elements. Um, so we have a current source that goes from node 0 to node 1 and has 1 ampere. And we have a resistor that goes from node 1 to node 2 with 10 ohms of resistance. And another resistor that goes from 2 to 0 and from 1 to 3 and from 3 to 0. So we have all these resistors. Then we have some analysis statement we want to do. We want to calculate some operating point and, and that's it. That's the end of this description. And so now, still, even if you use some LT spice today and draw the circuit, what will be done in the background is this net list will be generated and this net list, net list will be used to start the solver. And one big advantage from my point of view is <laughs> that you can take a look at this and check it and you, you could also write it by hand or you could also use another software to write these net lists. And this is what I really do a lot in research for simulating, I don't know, transmission line circuits. Yeah, because I have very, very complicated circuits and I don't want to draw them by hand. So I let the computer draw them for me or um, write them down for me. Because it's, there's lots of repetition in there and you can just use loops to generate this netlist. So this is what will be done in the background. And then we introduce nodal voltages. So these nodal voltages are always the voltage from a certain node to the ground, reference to the ground. So we have one, two, three of these nodal voltages. And this is also what will be calculated by the simulator. So you don't directly get voltages across elements. You always get voltage at, voltages at these nodes, always reference to the ground. Okay, and so then what will be done in the background is some equation system will be set up um, in matrix form. And yeah, does any one of you remember how nodal analysis works? How long is your fundamentals of e electrical engineering lectures ago? So there are three rules how to set up this equation system. Yeah, cur current in equals current out. This is like uh, Kirchhoff's current law and we also need Kirchhoff's voltage law that voltages inside a mesh. Um, yeah, but I mean this special way of calculating circuits with nodal analysis. Do you remember? We have, we have probably talked about this. What, what, is, what is on the main diagonal of this matrix? What is on the off diagonal? Uh, elements of the matrix and what is inside this vector here with the sources? Exactly, so we have admittances here. It's like G or uh, yeah, conductance or admittance times voltage gives current. So this also fits from the units. So then on the main diagonal
yeah, we have all the elements. We, we always have the sum of the elements that are connected to a certain node. So if we check the first node here, we have R1 and R3 connected. That's why we have here G1 plus G3. On the second node, we have the elements 1 and 2 connected. That's why here we have 1 and 2. And here we have 3 and 4 connected. And that's why here we have 3 and 4. So on the main diagonal, this is what the solver does in the background. We have all the elements connected to the node. On the off diagonal elements, we always have the connecting elements between two nodes and always with a negative sign. So between one and two, we have one. Between one and three, we have three. And between two and three, we have nothing. And, and these don't count here. And that's why we have one, three, and nothing. If we check um, one, three, and nothing, and one, three, and nothing. And then, so this was the second rule and the third rule on this, in this vector here of these, of these elements um, of the sources, we always have the sources connected to a certain node. And plus if they flow towards the node, minus if, we, if they flow away from the node. So we can check we have just one source that is connected positively to node one, nothing connected, no source connected to two or three, and that's why we have one, zero, zero. Okay, so now we want to calculate these voltages here. So how, how to calculate these voltages? Rearrange the matrix equation. Yeah, and before we do this, we maybe insert uh, the values of the circuit elements and convert them to conductances. So 10 ohm is 0 0.1 Siemens. And insert this there, rearrange this equation to give us the nodal voltages. And so if you solve this matrix equation in MATLAB or Octave or Python or wherever, you would get this result of 10 volts, 5 volts, 5 volts. And so before we simulate this in LT Spice, what we will do in a second, we can think and shortly check if this makes sense. So the, the solution would be now that we have 10 volts here. So across this circuit from the uh, top branch to the bottom branch, we have 10 volts. And here and here across these two lower resistances, we always have 5 volts. And so just to make a quick check if this works, if we have 10 ohm and 10 ohm in series, what do we get? 20. If we have 10 and 10 in series, what do we get? Also 20. If we have 20 and 20 in parallel, we once again get 10. And if we have 1 ampere flowing through a 10 ohm total resistance, we get 10 volts. We get 10 volts. So if we have 10 volts from here to here and these two resistors are equal, then we should get 5 volt on top, 5 volt at the bottom, 5 volt on top, 5 volt at the bottom. Okay, so the result that we got here fits. And now we can try to do this and simulate this in LT Spice. So I will switch over to my LT Spice, close everything here. And so this is how LT Spice should look like if you open it up. And if you, I don't know, if you have your computer running now, uh, you can switch it on. I, I, will, I will wait for some minutes. Um, once again, say hello to the five people watching the live stream. Uh, you can also, of course, go to this website if you don't have it already of analog devices and download LT Spice from there and install it on your computer. As said, it should not be super large, should not be uh, too much of a problem. And if you install it and if you run it, then it should look like this. So this is, let me make this a little smaller and have it side by side. Okay, so um, 
people are still clicking something, so I expect computers are not running it. You have to log in. Does it work already? Yeah. It's installing. Okay. So it's it's doing something like uh, this step one, step two, step three thing. Okay. Yeah, because if you install it and if you run it for the first time, then it will um, create some libraries in the background. Um, and so if you, I think these libraries will be individually created for, for every user. So if you don't have it, Uh, if you don't run it already under your user on your computer, then it might take some time until it pops up. Okay, still looking good. Okay, C can I can I continue? Okay, excellent. Okay, so then. I said, if you run it, it should look like this. I will enlarge it. And first thing that you need to do is click on this to get a new schematic. And then the background should turn gray and it should look like this. And now we want to rebuild the circuit. And we find resistors here. They are easy to find. So you can click on this resistor and then you, your, your mouse turns into a huge resistor and you can place resistors on your circuit. And so I will place one resistor here and you can see now the numbering automatically changes into R2 and so I will place R2 below this and R3 on the side and R4 here. So I have these four resistors. And now I don't want to have a fifth resistor so if I press escape on the keyboard, I get out of this mode of drawing new resistors. And then you can check if you turn your mouse wheel, you can zoom in and out in the circuit. And if you hit space, then it will always zoom to a full view of this circuit. And okay, so what, what, what do we do next or what, what do we need next? We need to have the current source. Unfortunately, we don't see any current source here, but there is uh, some symbol here that is called component. And you would also find this component um, here, right of the diet. It's also here for edit component. You could also press F2 on your keyboard. And then a new window pops up and there you find the current source. And we can select the current source and now our mouse arrow turns into a huge current source and we can move around and place this current source on our schematic. What's the issue with this current source? It's pointing downwards, but it should point upwards. And now I, if, you, if you look uh, into the lower left corner of the screen be below my current source. It's not visible, unfortunately, in the room because the projector is somehow misaligned. But in the, in the stream, you should see it. And on your screen, you should see it as well. There is some hint. We can press Control R to rotate and Control E to mirror. So if we press Control R two times, we can, uh, we can rotate the source by 180 degree and place it somewhere here. And once again, with escape, we go out of this mode. Okay, so then the next step is to draw wires in our circuit. So the wiring tool can be found here, a small pencil to wire the elements. And I will wire, and then I think there might be a question in the room. So I will at first maybe wire um, the outer circle, and then maybe this inner branch. Okay, so now everything is wired. Okay, the, the next step then would be now all our elements need to have some values for their, 
um, yeah, for how, how large is the current, how large is the resistance. And as some people are still clicking, I might wait a second uh, to continue. And the wire tool is here on top, the small pencil. This is the wiring tool. And if you don't have it there, I think then you should also find it um, uh, under edit and draw wire with, with, and it should be also accessible with the function key F3. And if you, if you properly wire it, um, so if you, if you have drawn something wrong, if you hit escape on the keyboard, your mouse turns into a small scissors and you can cut wires and I will, I will cut some wires once again and you can see that if you properly connect the wire these soldering pads let's say they will disappear because you have properly connected somehow soldered your wire to the element and oops, if you this was wrong um, so once again with escape you can delete and if you create a node, then one of these soldering dots will appear here to show that these wires are now properly connected to each other. So th th this looks good. From the wiring point of view, this looks good. So now our elements need to have some values. And to give them values, we need to click on the elements with the alternative mouse button, with the alternative mouse key. And then a new window will pop up. So here we can now change the DC value of our source and change it to one ampere. So then this I turns into a one and we do the same stuff for the resistors. So clicking on the resistor, we can change the resistance. I will change to 10 ohm. This R turns into a 10. Um, and repeat this for all the four resistors. And you can, you can also use the mouse button, the alternative mouse button to click on directly on the 10 or on this R. And you can also change the value there. If you take the mouse button and click on this R1, then you change the label, then you really change the name of the resistor. Um, and I would not suggest to do this. I mean, you can do it. Um, but I think it should always start with R because the R tells the program that it's a resistor. Um, so I, I think it's not a good idea to change uh, the first letter, but you can, you can then change the name to something arbitrary. Okay, people are still clicking. That's why I will wait some time. Um, there, there's one nonsense message in the chat. But except for this, nothing is happening. Okay, everything clear? Questions? How to rotate with control R. So if, if I have, let, let me uh, try to draw another current source. So in the lower left corner of the program, it says control R to rotate and control E to mirror. And I think mirroring with the, the voltage source won't do too much because it will just mirror the labels. Um, but control R does rotate and control E does mirror. And I don't want to draw another one, so I just press escape. If I, for example, find a switch, which is SW, so here you can see that how the, how the mirroring thing really mirrors and um, mirrors these two additional connections to control the switch from one side to the other. Um, but it's yeah, you could more or less also do it with rotating, but um, yeah, sometimes it's handy. And mirroring obviously always mirrors with the vertical axis, uh, so it mirrors horizontally. Okay, 
More questions? I mean, it's always a challenge to uh, d d not, not do it too fast and not too slow. <laughs> okay, but students are helping each other. So I, I, will, I will continue for a brief moment. And so what we would like to do next is to run the simulation, or at least, I mean, so we have now created our circuit. Uh, why not run it? So running the simulation works with this small person here that runs. And if we click on this, a new window pops up with some settings for the simulation. And I think you also find this here under simulate and run. So I might also click on this. And so then you can see all the different ways that we have for simulating our circuit. So we have transient analysis, we have AC analysis. This is what we will uh, come back to later. You can do a DC sweep, simulating the circuit for different DC voltages. You can do noise analysis. You can calculate DC transfer functions. And the, the thing that we want to do now uh, is at the end of the list, we want to calculate a DC operating point. We will just, we have just this one source, one ampere, what will happen for current and voltage in all our circuit elements. So I select this DC operating point, which computes a DC operating point, And all capacitances are open circuits. All inductors are short circuits and say OK. And then unfortunately, we get some error message or some warning. And the error message says, our circuit does not have a conduction path to ground. Please flag one node or please flag a node as ground. And this is what I mentioned before in my slides. If you remember that um, we, we need to have one reference node because otherwise it would not make sense where to, to which node are these nodal voltages reference that we are calculating. So we need to flag one node as ground and we will select this bottom node here. And Selecting one node as ground works with this ground symbol here on top. Um, so I think if you have the mouse there, then it says this is ground. I think you also find this here under edit and place ground or with the button G on the keyboard. And I will place the ground here and I will take some additional wire to connect this ground. And Once again, hit escape on the keyboard to um, exit this wire drawing mode. And now, once again, unfortunately, it's not visible here on the projector. Um, or just if I maybe make the window a little smaller, then it should be visible. So once again, if you check the lower left corner of the program, and hoover the mouse, move the mouse over this ground node, then it says, okay, this is ground. And if we check the other nodes, then it says, hey, this is also node 001. This is what has been automatically numbered to be the first node. If you check this position here, this is node two, and this is node three. So by good luck, <laughs> it automatically selected the very same node numbering that we had. So now if we hit the run guy here or person, then we get our results and the results say, okay, the voltage at the first node is 10 volts. The voltage at the second node is five volts. The voltage at the, fifth, uh, at the third node is also five volts. The current through our current source is one ampere and the current going through all our four resistors is 0.5 ampere each, which totally makes sense. Okay, so now if the node, and, and now once the simulation has, is finished, um, you can also see that these DC operating point solutions, that they are also shown here in the lower left corner. So we have 10 volts here, we have five volts here, we have five volts here. Um, You can also see that 
the current flowing through the resistors is displayed there, also the power dissipation in watts. So each of these resistors now has 2.5 watts, which totally makes sense because 2.5 times 4 is 10 watts and 1 ampere 10 volts is also 10 watts that uh, is generated by the source and the power dissipation here for the source if you check the number is minus 10 watts which also makes sense because minus 10 watts of dissipation is like 10 watts that are generated that are outputted by the source I think there's also some uh, some way to um, show grid mark anchors to display these values directly beneath the capacitors but um, I think I don't I don't find it right now efficiency report mark anchors no there was some some settings somewhere um, how to display this directly also into the circuit label net place plus tip hmm. if there's some if there's some expert watching please write something in the chat how to do it but I'm, I'm not sure at the moment how to how to do it anyhow so thing is if you on if the automatic node numbering does not fit to what what you would like to have you can also manually label the nodes. So for this, there is this label here, uh, which is here on top. Let me show it once again, how to label a net, or it's also here under edit components label net, or you can also find it uh, when pressing the F4 button on the keyboard. And so here you can insert a label so I will place a label with one here and I will change this into a two and a three and a second so let's change this into a two and let's change this into a three which once again works with the alternative mouse button and now if I connect them it will also draw the numbers in a slightly different way but now we can check okay this is really node one so we have now number manually numbered or labeled this node as node 1 this is node 2 this is node 3 and if I rerun the simulation and put the results window somewhere here now you can see okay this is exactly our node 1 node 2 node 3 uh, voltages as before and now nothing would change on these numbers even if I introduce or would, would add um, more elements um, or delete something or, or, or so. Okay, so then I would like to save this and in my folder here I will just create a new folder for today and save the circuit there so this was the, the DC circuit and save it and just run it once again okay and so now if I just to show if I open up this folder here that I just created and open it up in a new window in my Windows Explorer so then just to check the files that are now inside this folder so there is this schematic itself and if you open up the schematic with some editor um, you see the schematic is also more or less just a text file that includes all the wires, all the elements um, so you, you could also create the circuit schematic yourself um, if, you, if you like. We had a student who, who had a project on parsing these numbers and creating 
a circuit tick schematic automatically from LT Spice. So you draw a circuit in LT Spice, you want to have it in your latest document. So there was a converter from LT Spice to circuit ticks that would do some kind of conversion. I think at the end it never perfectly worked, but it was some idea. Um, so then there is a log file, and the log file says, um, here's our circuit, we do operation point analysis. It also, for example, gives you the matrix size, and the matrix size, remember, because we have two nodes, we have a three, four, uh, three times three matrix, um, so you, you can check some details there. And here is this netlist that I mentioned. So it's really th the same thing in there. We have a resistor R1 going from one to two, node 1 to node 2 with 10 ohms. We have a resistor. So if I place this side by side, you can see this perfectly fits to what is shown here in the circuit. We have our source. We do operating point analysis, and that's it. And yeah, the raw output, I think, in this case, is also just a text file. Uh, with the meaning, but the output is binary, so you cannot directly see it in a, in a text editor here. Uh, th there is probably a way also to output it as a text file, but uh, not like this. Okay, so now we have successfully simulated our maybe first, second circuit. Um, and we, we are quite sure that the result is correct because we have done the calculation by hand um, and everything makes sense. Okay, so we have simulated this example. What questions do you have so far? No questions? How did you save the last part of the text file? Um, how, how, to, how to find this netlist? Yeah. So I've just saved the schematic um, and I've, I've just saved it into a new folder that I've created so that this folder is empty. And I think once you save, now it will ask me if I would uh, overwrite the file, I will say yes. And I think if you save and run, and run the simulation again, then this netlist will be created. If, I think if you just save, it, will, it won't create the netlist. The netlist will be created if you run. Yeah. If you run the solver, then it will create this netlist. Okay, more questions? Okay, this does not seem to be the case. So, then we can change our analysis um, just a little bit and go to AC analysis. And for AC analysis, we will change two things. We will change our current source into a voltage source. And because before we had 10 volts, I will also change the voltage here into a 10 volt voltage source so that these currents, for example, should not really change. We should get the same values as before. And we will change the capacitor into a one millifarad capacitor. I'm not sure if this is visible in, um, on the, in, the, in the stream right now because my camera window, oh, it's, I think it's visible, okay. So, one millifarad of capacitance and a 10 volt source. Okay, so, if we go back, now we want to get rid of our current source here, we want to delete this current source. Mm. We could just cut it out, use the scissors here, or you can press escape on your keyboard to also turn the mouse arrow into some scissors and cut this away. So now the current source is gone. Where do we find the voltage source? Probably the same place where we found the current source. So once again, under component, and if you check component, there's also a voltage source there, which is called voltage. So we hit okay, then we get a voltage source 
And now the direction is perfect because we want to have positive voltage at the top and the reference at the ground. So we just insert the voltage there. Then we could draw a second voltage source with escape on the keyboard. We can once again exit this drawing mode. Okay, so now if we change, if we want to change the voltage of this voltage source, uh, we, we once again use the alternative mouse button to click on this source. And here we could insert a DC value. And we, could, we, could, we could do it for a second. Um, so if we do it with 10 volts, what should happen to our results? We should get exactly the same thing as before. So if we check, first plausibility check, okay. No, nothing changes. Ah, one, one thing changes. The, the current is now negative. It was positive before, now it's negative. And why? It's the convention of LT Spice um, that current and voltage at the source are pointing in the same direction. So current here in the source is also pointing downwards. In most textbooks, at least in the German ones, current would point upwards. Current and voltage would have different directions at the source. And this is something that I'm that with garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, this is some, some small difference that makes a difference, can make a difference at the end when you check your, your results. Okay, so the current is also here meant to go downwards in the source. Okay, so then we can uh, delete this DC value once again because we want to have, we want to make it an AC source. And to make it an AC source, we go to advanced and then there's lots of stuff here. Um, and you can see there's functions. It would be more clear if it would say transient functions because this is for the transient analysis. This is for the DC analysis. We don't want to have DC. We want to have AC, small signal AC analysis. This is what you do with complex phasers. And so here we introduce some AC amplitude, say 10 volts. And now the, the 10 changes into AC 10, which means this is some AC source now. And now we also need to change our operating point solution because this operating point thing here was for DC circuits. Now we want to have, we want to calculate it with AC. Um, so I think, as, as mentioned here in the lower left corner, right click to edit. So we do right click and we can switch from DC operating point solution to AC analysis. And so for the AC analysis, we can select different types of sweeps because AC analysis usually means you simulate it for many frequencies at the very same time. So we can check, we can have a sweep over some octave, over a decade, we can have a linear sweep. So the, the first two would be both logarithmic sweeps. This would be a linear frequency sweep. And we can also just select a list of frequencies. And le let's check my slides. Uh, nothing is mentioned here about the frequency, but um, at first we could, I don't know, select 50 Hertz, for example, right? So a list of just one frequency gives us the result for was just one frequency. Okay, so we say 50 Hertz. Now this changes into AC list 50, which means we do an AC analysis at one particular frequency of 50 Hertz. Now, if we hit the run button, we get a result. And we can take a look and re discuss this result a little bit. So now our voltages and currents are displayed as complex numbers by magnitude and phase. And we have the same magnitudes as before, 10, 5, and 5, and 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and so on, and 1. And the phase for all of them is zero, and the phase for 
the, the voltage uh, for the current through the source is minus 180 degree or could be also plus 180 degree because it's pointing in the opposite direction, what, what we just discussed before. So this also perfectly well, makes sense, I would say. What questions do you have so far? Everything, everything okay? Okay, excellent. So then, now, now let's change one resistor into a capacitor. And so once again, I use escape on the keyboard, turn my mouse into these small scissors, cut the capacitor, uh, cut the resistor and introduce a capacitor. And now something from my point of view totally stupid happens. I, I'm not sure whoever made up this um, because the, the capacitor has a different footprint. The capacitor is smaller than the resistor, so we place the capacitor and we, we need to add a small segment, a small wire segment to connect the capacitor. And now we can once again change the value of this capacitor to be one millifarad, so we just use one small m. Right? If we want to, if we would like to have micro, you can see if I press U on the keyboard, this would automatically change into this micro, but we want to have one milli. Okay, so now the question is what happens in the circuit? What should happen to our voltages here and to the currents and so on if we introduce this additional capacitor? And let me make this um, full screen and maybe zoom in just a little bit. So um, any, any ideas? What, what, what should happen? What should happen in the circuit? What should stay the same as before? What should change? Yeah. So, in this, if we take a look on the left side of our circuit, the left branch, what should happen here? Nothing. Nothing should change. Should be the very same as before because we have this. Voltage here, current voltage should, should stay the very same as before. And in this side of the circuit, the current here on top and the current here at the bottom, they should still both be the same because it's a serious connection. There should be the same um, current going through this, but the, 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 the voltage should change in a way that now there is a phase shift of this voltage here. And the easiest way to think about this is to draw um, a phasor diagram. So let me find my drawing program. And um, insert this here. Or maybe, maybe it's a bit too large. And maybe I will just cut out the circuit. Then the remaining thing stays white. Okay, so this is the circuit. And now I need my, to switch on my drawing tablet and make some space here on my... Hey, and please connect via Bluetooth. It worked before. Ah, now it's connected. Okay, excellent. So um, let's try to, try to draw... Um, a phasor diagram for this and so for this voltage here I will use black and I will draw one arrow for this voltage which, which is the, the voltage of our source or the voltage we want. Oh and there's bad weather outside so we have lots of time to continue the workshop because no one would like to leave. Okay, so then I can, I can use different colors and I can use, um, for example, blue 
for this voltage here and I could use green for this voltage here. And if I draw these two voltages into my very same phasor diagram here, where, where should they be? They should also be on this line and point in the same direction and they should, they should go um, and split this into half. So the half of the input voltage should be VR1, the blue phaser, and half of the voltage should be the other half and this should be VR2. Okay, so this now we already have. And so now the interesting thing is what happens on this side. So we if, if we have a current pointing in this direction, and I think the color is, no, color is not misleading. So if we now have, um, yeah, uh, uh, let's, let's draw a different diagram here at the bottom. If we have a current in the second branch that points in this direction. So this is the current I here. So how would then in red, how would this voltage look like? And in, I don't know, I also have gray as a color. How would the red and the gray voltage look like? So for this red voltage across the resistor, it should be the very same direction. They should be in parallel. It should be like this. Let's draw it a little longer. So this should be VR3. And so then, where in which direction should this voltage across the capacitor point? 90 degree, 90 degree up, 90 degree down. Down, why down? Because of the impedance of the capacitor. So the voltage across the capacitor is 1 over j omega c multiplied with the current. And 1 over j is the same as minus j. 1 over j is the same as minus j. And minus j is the same as e2 minus j 90 degree. So it should point downwards. So this should be v c, the voltage across the capacitor. Okay, and so now these two voltages together should be the same as our source voltage. So if I, if I take the black color once again, this should be they both together. Uh, did not really get the direction. Now it's better. So they together should give us V1, finally. And so now th there should always be this 90 degree angle here. But depending on the frequency, as we can see here for the impedance, if we have a very small impedance, one divided by something small gives us a large voltage across the capacitor. If we have a high frequency, one divided by something large gives us a small impedance then we do get a small voltage across the capacitor and a correspondingly higher voltage across the resistor. So, hmm, yeah, um, let, let's, let's draw some examples. So if we have a small frequency, then we should get a, a small voltage across the resistor and a large voltage across the capacitor and they both together should give us the same voltage as before. This should be a 90 degree angle. So if we have a medium frequency, let's say, then we should have almost in my example at the bottom, we should have the same voltage as uh, at the resistor and the same voltage in size at the capacitor and both together should give us the source voltage. There is a 90 degree angle here. And if we go to very high frequencies, uh, we get much more 
voltage across the resistor and much less voltage across the capacitor. Still together they should give us our source voltage. And now if I would draw this for many more frequencies and if I connect all these points here, what should I get? Which geometrical shape in my phasor diagram here? Uh, there is an ancient Greek person and this uh, tailless circle tells us if we have a half circle it's always a challenge to draw circles um, so if we have this half circle, then all the angles below this half circle are 90 degree angles, are right angles, right? And this is the same thing that we have here in our phasor diagram. And so um, if, we, if we label our nodes, this here is ground. This would be node one. This would be the potential at node 2 and this would be the potential at node 3. Or this would be also 3 or this would be also 3. And so now th the, um, the circuit does something interesting because if, if you, let me take a different color for this, if we take light blue, if we take a look at this voltage here, the voltage from 2 to 3, then it's always the voltage pointing from the center of the circle to these to all these points here. And the amplitude, the magnitude of this phasor, of this blue phasor, if we change the frequency, what happens to the magnitude, the amplitude? It's always staying constant. But the phase would change from plus 180 degree to zero degree. And the 180 degree we get if we have very high resistances, uh, uh, if we have a high uh, impedance of the capacitor. So for low frequencies, we get 180 degree. For high frequencies, we get zero degree. We should get zero degree. So if, if this is the input, and this is the output, it's like a phase shifting circuit. It's doing phase shift. And so the, this center frequency here, uh, or this, yeah, the frequency where, where we have this, um, the, 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 the same impedance across the resistor and the capacitor um, should be at the frequency or should, should be at the case where R equals one over R one over omega c and if we change this into frequency we get frequency is one over rc and this is angular frequency so our real frequency should be uh, one over two times p times r times c so and um, we can just try to calculate this in octave uh, because it's the simplest way it's the simplest way to do so so there is my I'm, I'm looking for my mouse button ah, there's my octave window and r equals 10 c equals 1 millifarad which is 1 times 10 to the power of minus 3 and then omega is 1 over r and c and we get 100 okay we could also have calculated this by hand and um, so F is, doesn't make sense, 100, should be. Um, F is omega divided by 2 times P. And then we get 15.9. So if we use this 15.9 as a frequency, we will, we will check. We will, we will see what, what it does. But at least we have some idea what the circuit does. I'm not really sure about the numbers, but let's see. If we do it with the 50 hertz, 
Let's do it at first like this. Okay, we see nothing changed on our input voltage. Uh, nothing changed at the voltage at this node here. But uh, the third voltage here changes. It's now three volts with some different phase shift. And the current through the first two resistors is still 0 0.5 ampere. And the current through the third resistor and the capacitor is something else now with a different phase. So what, what would you say about this phase here? What, what, what should it be and what value do we get? It should be zero, right? Yeah. It should be zero, but we get minus one point something times 10 to the power of minus 15. Yeah, we get something small. It's, it's numerically zero, it's just noise of the simulation, right? It's not really a meaningful result, it's just the noise of the simulation. And this is a little bit with, okay, we have no garbage in, but still a little bit garbage out because program is not perfectly calculating correctly. So this is numerically um, zero. If, if someone would, if some student would give me this as the actual result of the simulation, I would say it's wrong. It's not really there. Okay, so now if we change the frequency uh, to the 15 point something hertz that we just calculated, then what should happen? We should get um, yeah, we, sh we, we get 7 volts here and minus 45 degree of this voltage. Which perfectly makes sense. If, if I go back to our um, thing that we have just calculated, right? Then um, now, now this voltage here... Um, at this node should have a 45 degree angle and should, if this is five, and this is five, then this should be seven point something from, from, the, from the size, from the length. So I think this perfectly makes sense. Yeah, so minus 45 degree, I think, yeah, if we check, uh, so now, now it's, now it's this, this voltage here, so this has mon minus 45 degree of angle. This per perfectly fits. Okay. Do you have questions so far? Okay. So then let's, so once again, we have, we have did some cross check. Yeah, it fits. It make, makes sense, especially with this value of frequency and so on. So now, of course, a big, a, this is a calculation that we could also have done by hand. Um, so now one big advantage of LT Spice is of course that we can repeat the simulation very quickly and very rapidly for different frequencies. So let's change it here once again and now let's do some, some logarithmic sweep over a decade and let's use, I don't know, a hundred frequencies per decade and as a start frequency let's use something that is much smaller than the 15 hertz. So, I don't know, for example, one hertz. And as a stop frequency, let's use something that is considerably larger, for example, one kilohertz. And now let's press OK. And then our simulation command changes a little bit. Um, I will enlarge this. And now if we hit run again, now of course we, we are simulating from one hertz over until, ten, uh, until one kilohertz. So we have three decades, and in each decade we have a uh, hundred points. So in total we could, should get something like 300 frequency points. And of course it would be no use to display these 300 frequency points in a table like we got before. And that's why now if you hit run, a new window will pop up where you get a diagram. And so now if you hover the mouse over your circuit schematic, um, you can see, okay, we get a small voltage probe to measure voltages across 
or at the nodes. And if you hover over the elements, you get small current probes to measure current through these elements. And so first thing that we could do is we could measure our source voltage. And the source voltage should be 10 volts. And so now let's do this. And oh, hmm, we get something in dB here. Does it make sense? We get 20 dB. There's still, still a thunderstorm outside. Uh, we get 20 dB and does it make sense? Yeah, it does because 20 dB for voltages is a factor of 10. So it's, if we have 20 dB reference to one volt, it would be 10 volts. But of course we can change the scale of this axis. We can change it into linear or into logarithmic. Let's change it into logarithmic. Uh, and then it does not work. So let's change it into linear. And okay, then we need to uh, say tick bottom top. Uh, we need to, because all the values are 10, we need to adjust the scale a little bit. Top tick bo uh, bottom should be nine. Okay, so now, now we see, okay, it's really 10 volt. This is the solid line, 10 volts. What, 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 what is the dash line here? And it's not visible on the projection screen. Um, so I will. I will rescale the window size, but now it's visible here. So what is displayed on the second axis? The face. And so what should happen to the face in our circuit for the source voltage? It should be always zero, but it obviously it isn't. It's jittering around. Why is this happening? No, not really. I mean, because here the, the, the voltage is given by our voltage source. It's once again just numerical noise. It's just numerical error of the simulation. And if you check here, it's femtofarad. So it's F, uh, or no, it's not femto, it's femto degree, right? It's very, very small changes of the angle, 10 to the power of minus 15 or so changes of degree. And this is once again, just numerical, just some numerical error of the simulation. Okay, so if we check the voltage here, we can see it's similar, but just half. And if we check the voltage here, now we can see, okay, now we get something meaningful because the voltage at this across this capacitor changes from something very large at high frequencies to something very small at low frequencies. Uh, something very large at low frequencies to something very small at high frequencies. And we can also see how this phase changes from zero degree to minus 90 degree. Okay, and so now we have all the three individual voltages here. And what we would like to see, and what we've discussed as before, is this voltage here, the voltage across this bridge, the voltage between node two and node three. So how do we get this voltage? Um, so I will, I will press escape, then I get scissors, I can delete all these voltages and go onto the diagram and and add a trace manually. And so here I see my visible traces and I can also do calculations with them. So if I calculate the difference between the voltage at node two and three, I get exactly this voltage that we would like to have, the voltage across this bridge in our circuit. And so what, would we, what, what should we see there now? We should see that amplitude stays constant and that the phase changes from 
180 to 0 degree. So let's see, phase stays constant is half of the voltage of our source and phase changes from 180 to 0 degree over frequency. P perfectly nice what is happening here. And so this is what, we, what you would call a, a Bode diagram uh, where we see, where you see magnitude and phase. And if you click on, on the axis once again, you can also change the representation into a Nyquist diagram. And Nyquist diagram is what in Germany what we call Ortskurve. Um, so it's a Nyquist plot, right? I mean, here we see that um, it's, a, it's, a, it's ex exactly ha the, the circle that, that you would expect. Um, so if I change the scale a little bit and maybe change this, so now we exactly see the half circle that I've drawn before, right? With the zero volt in the center and five volts in this direction at low frequency, at high frequencies. Here we, if you, if you click on this, you also get a marker. So we can see, there, no, I think frequency is hidden behind my camera window. So if you check the, the frequency axis here, so here on the left side of this Nyquist diagram, we start with the very low frequencies as discussed. Frequency is moving up here on top. We have this 15.9, 15.8 something. And then if we increase the frequency, phase goes to zero degree. So exactly the same half Thales circle that we've, that we've seen before. Okay, what questions do you have so far? Sure. So, how can we simulate two electric circles on the one diagram, for example? For example, we spawn the resistors and the second one is capacitor. So, I don't really get the question. You want to simulate it individually? No. No. I want, yes, I want to simulate this individually, but I need to draw only on the one diagram. Yeah, you can. I think you, you, we could also add um, a second source here, and to the second source, add another resistor, a fourth resistor. And if I would wire these two circuits together and um, add a different, add another ground here. And say, okay, this is now. Um, a 5 volt source and if I have a 5 volt source and a 5 ohm resistor I should get one ampere of current in the second circuit and so now if I re-simulate and if I plot the current in this um, now it's perfectly probably not the, the perfect way of representing it here so I will change back to my Bode plot that we had before and change back to a logarithmic scale, then we see, okay, we get one ampere of current in the second circuit independent of frequency, exactly what we would, what we would expect. But, but I mean, what would you like to do? You would like to simulate two circuits in the very yeah. same problem. Yes. But it should work like this way. I mean, th this, this is exactly how it should work. Okay, more questions? So then let's come back to my slides, come to the next example. So what we will do now is we will introduce another resistor. And the resistor here should be quite large in comparison to the resistors that we had before. So before we had 10 ohms and now we will introduce 10 kilo ohms. Thousand times larger. And we will change to transient analysis. Okay, so um, question is, what should happen if we insert this resistor here at the center to our circuit? Yes. 
almost nothing because the resistor is quite large in comparison to the other resistors. But if you insert this resistor and if you would now like to calculate the circuit by hand, it would be much more complicated because in comparison to what we had before here, they, these were in series, these were in series, the two branches will, are in parallel and now they here, they look like they are in parallel, but they are not because of this resistor. They look like they are in parallel, but they are not because of this resistor. They are also not in series anymore because of this resistor. They are not in series. So here you would do something, you need to do something like um, convert, um, convert this Y circuit into a delta circuit or convert this Y circuit into a delta circuit or convert this delta circuit into a Y circuit or something like this to, um, to do it by hand. But luckily in LT Spice we don't have to change too much. So I will, I will delete the second circuit here. Um, press space and so do the necessary changes. I will add another resistor here in the center that I will just call R4 and wire it and change the value and you now already know how it works into 10 kilo ohm. So the resistor is already there. Let's see how I I've, I've called this RBR for, for the bridge resistance, so maybe I will also change this here, call it RBR for the bridge resistance. And now I would also like to change the voltage source. And we don't want to have this AC voltage anymore, now we want to have really a transient function. Still we want to do the same thing as before, so we have um, we, we, we choose the sinus voltage source. We say, okay, we have zero offset, zero volt offset, we have 10 volts of amplitude. So then it's a good question, what frequency do we select? Maybe the 15.9 that we had before, that we just calculated here. So let's once again use this 15.9 something. And no delay, no phase shift, no nothing. Um, everything else I will leave empty. So then we have these, we get this sinusoidal voltage source. And then of course we need also to change our simulation command, going from AC simulation into transient simulation. So I use the, the alternative mouse button and we go from AC to transient. And now we need to select uh, new parameters. So what would be a good stop time for the simulation? How, how long should we run the simulation at this particular frequency? A few milliseconds, yeah, but if we, how could we calculate the periodic time? One, one, one by F, right? So if we calculate the periodic time, we get, we get this, lightning. Um, and if we take three times the periodic time, we, get, we would get this. So three full cycles would give us this. So this would be 188 milliseconds. So if we take 200 milliseconds, for example, this would be probably a good choice, right? Okay, and um, I, will, I will also tick another button here that says skip initial operating point solution because at the beginning we would like this capacitor to be empty um, and say okay. Yeah, and then we get this abbreviation here that says UIC which means use initial condition and the initial condition is that the capacitor at the beginning should be empty. So now if we run the simulation once again, um, oh, then we get some error message, interesting. Maybe I will delete this UIC flag here once again. Let's see if this helps with something. 
kind of strange. Um, I will I will remove this check mark here for the I think for the step the load current source I think this is wrong I don't know this is probably an old setting from some simulation before okay now this looks good and now if I introduce this flag once again this still looks good let's see if this changes something okay so now once again we would like to plot the same thing as before we would like to plot our source voltage and we can see okay source voltage is sinusoidal and we can add the plot the plot that we had before Oops, no not not the plot plane delete this i want to have uh, add trace and we can once again take this bridge voltage v2 minus v3 okay and this looks meaningful because yeah, or does, does it look meaningful? So if we compared what we had done before, we, we are now exactly here once again in, in this case here at this particular frequency. So our output voltage, the magnitude should be If we, are, if we are simulating at this frequency, the magnitude should be half of the input voltage as before, and the phase should be this 90 degree phase shift. And so this is our input voltage. Um, this we can see is 10 volt. This is our output voltage. This is 5 volt, it's exactly half of this. And there's a 90 degree phase shift because the, the output voltage is 90 degree earlier already, which is if you add plus 90 degree to the phase, everything is happening, happening 90 degree earlier. So this perfectly makes sense if we would go to higher frequencies um, or lower frequencies, we, we sh should just change the phase in this case. Yeah, or if I if I select a higher uh, capacitor, I mean, it's now it's kind of difficult to change the phase because we also need to change the trends in time. But if I have a larger capacitor, it's like larger phase, uh, it's like larger frequency, then we should get less phase shift. So let's run it again. We can see, okay, we get less phase shift if we take a the same capacitor as before. And of course, we should get the same 90 degree phase shift as before. And if we take an, an even smaller capacitor, 0 0.1 millifarad, we should get more phase shift, like smaller frequencies. And we can see now input and output are almost 100, 180 degree out of phase, like here in, in this um, diagram. So we have now done the same changing, leaving the frequency constant, but changing the value of the capacitor. So we get smaller voltage here, less phase angle, 90 degree phase angle, much more voltage across the capacitor and almost 180 degree phase angle. Yeah, and once again, these are such plausibility checks that you can do. Change something small in your simulation. Think about what would you be your expectation, what should change and does it really change in this way? Okay, so let me just go back for a second to the one millifarad that we had before and then we should get this nice 90 degree phase shift. Okay, what questions do you have so far? I also still have the Twitch chat open, so if you have questions, uh, once again, hello to the five people watching on Twitch. If you have questions, feel free to pop these questions into the chat. 
uh, because I have my cell phone here right with me and there I should be able to see these questions. So are there more questions from within the room? I think the weather is clearing up so we should... Oh, is, it, is the weather getting better? Is, is it still raining? No, okay. Okay, so then we, we, can, we can come to the last, last example. And the last example is we change the resistor into a diet. So let's change the resistor into a diet. So I will hit escape on the keyboard with the scissors, delete this resistor over the bridge, use the diet, rotate the diet with control R on the keyboard so that the diet allows current flow into the right direction. Then we see, okay, unfortunately the diet once again has a smaller footprint as the resistor, the same footprint as the capacitor, so we need to rewire it a little bit. And so now the question is, what should happen? What should happen to our output voltage in this case? How should the output voltage, this blue voltage in my diagram, how should it change if we change the resistor into a diet? So what's the behavior of the diet? What's the characteristics of a diet? It allows, it allows current flow only in one direction. And in our case, it's allowing current flowing to the right. And so if current is flowing through the diet, what will happen to the voltage across the diet? It will drop to 0 0.7 or 0 0.4 or whatnot volt, depending on if it's a silicon diet or germanium diet. But we can expect this should be a standard silicon diet, something like 0 0.7 volts. So if, if we apply a positive voltage, the positive voltage will be limited to 0 0.7 volts and we should get a current flow. And if we apply a negative voltage, there should be no current like before because we had a very huge resistance and there was almost no current flowing through this huge resistance or before this we had this open circuit no current was flowing through this open circuit so what should happen is that the blue curve should more or less stay the same except for that the positive parts should be limited to 0 0.7 volts so the positive part of this curve should be clipped and the negative parts should remain the same as before. So let's try it out and let's see what it does. So I will hit the small running person and exactly this happens, right? So we still have the nine kind of 90 degree phase shift as before because it fits to our frequency, it fits to our, the value of, of our capacitor and the resistor and so on. But the positive half waves of this output are, less you, clipped to, to 0 0.7 volts um, of forward voltage of the diet. And this is once again a very nice plausibility check and think of how to think about what, what should happen in a circuit um, to do this, right? And so to summarize, we have done DC analysis, we have done AC analysis, we have done transient analysis, and we have now even done transient analysis with nonlinear elements like a diet. And um, you've seen there's lots of small details, like we need to have a node, we need to take care of what is the direction of current maybe in the voltage source. Then we get these strange phase angles that jitter around and are noisy because it's just a numerical error of the simulation, um, and so on and so on. Yeah? So um, as the usual saying is of uh, Edward Pelham Box, all models are wrong, some are useful, yeah, of a former colleague of, uh, who's, who says, um, Professor Marco Sarstedt, who says all models are wrong, some are wronger, right? But 
still some are not that wrong and some are useful. So to summarize, uh, my advice is to start with simple networks, uh, simple circuits where you have some idea what is happening. Yeah? Then you should know or you, you can know what you are doing and uh, you should always question your results and, and do some plausibility check, try to validate your models about or against other simulation tools against your, uh, let's say, intuition, against something that you can calculate with MATLAB or Octave or Python, uh, with applying basic Kirchhoff's current law, voltage law, uh, Ohm's law, and so on, and maybe analytical formulas or also measurements and experiments. And that's practically it. So if there are more questions, I'm happy to answer them. And um, Except for this, thanks for being here. Thanks for attending the workshop. Uh, this will also be the concluding workshop for, for this semester's workshop series. So there are no, don't be here next week on Monday because there will be no more workshops this year. This was the last one. Uh, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And I hope you take something useful uh, from this for your career as an electric engineer. So for sure, you're now not an expert in circuit simulation, but you have a, I think you have a very good idea on how does, how does it work. And um, yeah, still, we have time for some questions, if you'd like. Thank you.